one we're going to have a look at is pure air. Notice it's not just air, it's pure air. And here at Living Springs, I think you'll agree that we specialise in pure air, the best of air. There are so many beautiful evergreen trees around there and I think you realise those evergreen trees are, are giving off oxygen and that's what oxygen contains for it to be so essential for our life, is oxygen. Where uh, um, the, the part of our body, it's, it's actually every part of our body, requires oxygen and as we looked at yesterday, and I'll show you that again today, going inside the cell, which is the CBD of the human body. So yesterday we went inside and we looked at the journey of the glucose. We touched what happens with oxygen, but I want to pursue that a little bit more today. Remember the glucose goes in? It goes through a 20-step pathway, and the 20-step pathway delivers to us two units of energy. The end result of the 20-step pathway is a chemical form of glucose called pyruvate. And pyruvate, as the chemical form of glucose, gets fed into the next part of the cell. It's called the powerhouse of the cell. This is the mitochondria, specifically inside the Krebs cycle, which has an eight-step pathway. But that gives us 36 units of energy. And as we looked at yesterday, this pathway, no oxygen. So it produces energy by the process of fermentation. Whereas the eight-step pathway, it uses oxygen. What a difference oxygen makes. Mm -hmm. And it's because of this fact that, that we understand the statement that you will receive more energy than you expend on your morning walk. And I also showed you the other day how right now you're breathing in 500 mil and you're breathing out 500 mil. But when you got to the top of that hill, did the twins take you what to a hill this morning? Mm -hmm. When you got to the top of the hill and you're starting to breathe like this, you're breathing in 3,600 mil of air and you're breathing out 3,600 mil basically of waste because the combustion of oxygen and glucose at the cellular level gives off carbon dioxide and that is another gas. So when we breathe in, there are little tiny alveoli, they're like little sacs at the end of each bronchial in our, in our lungs. And over, I'll magnify it for you, over that little alveoli is a, a network of capillaries. They're your blood capillaries. So when we breathe in, the oxygen's coming in here, the oxygen goes into the little alveoli, the blood drops the carbon dioxide and picks up the oxygen. It's quite a fascinating process. So then we breathe out the carbon dioxide. Now, every few years we have to do the um, first aid course. I think no matter where you, you live, you have to do first aid courses. And we used to learn um, mouth to mouth resuscitation, yeah? Well, they don't do that anymore. <laughs> and they don't do that anymore for a few reasons because when you're breathing in, you are breathing a little bit of oxygen, but not a lot. You're actually breathing quite a bit of carbon dioxide. They recognize now that pumping the, the chest is, is more effective. So that, that's where it all happens, is right down there. So how many of these do we have? We've got about 300 million <laughs> alveoli in our lungs, and that's where the gaseous exchange takes place. What I want to do in this lecture is show you how you can ensure you're getting optimum amounts of oxygen and how you can prevent anything that would inhibit you taking up the oxygen. But let's first of all make a list of all the things that oxygen does. But let's have a look at the effect of no oxygen. It's called hypoxia. Hypoxia is a medical condition. It's actually a dangerous condition. It's lack of oxygen at the cellular level. And it can get to the point of death. But there are many people who are suffering from hypoxia, but they're not to the blue lip stage. They're not on death's door. These are some of the symptoms. Fatigue. 
feel like they've climbed a mountain and all they've done is got out of bed. Lethargy, can't even get out of bed. Nausea, the little cells that make up the stomach don't have enough oxygen and when they don't have enough oxygen they're not producing enough enzymes to break down your food. Headache, the brain cells don't have enough oxygen. I meet many people today that are drifting in that haze that lies between optimum health and severe illness. Do you find that? They're not jumping out of their skin with energy. They're not bedridden. They're just, Ooh. And if you say, how are you? What's the answer? Oh, not too bad. What's not too bad? Not too good. <laughs> how many people, when you meet them and you say, how are you? Say, fantastic. You'd go, what are they on? <laughs> What are they on? Don't you think that's sad that we've come to a time on planet Earth when the only people jumping out of their skin are the people on something? And when the people that are on something, when that eases off or wears off, where are they now? <laughs> I believe that God meant us human beings to feel good every day, every moment. Is that right? Absolute life, life should be very good. And if it's not very good, we've got to put our detective hat on and find out why isn't life very good? Is it because we are lacking oxygen? Now I want to show you two types of air that greatly influence the uptake of oxygen in our body. One type of air is alive with negative ions. Negative ions are electrically charged oxygen molecules. Where do you find them? Well, let me show you how they're made. Water droplets pass through the air, casting off negative ions. I memorise that. I like to get it straight from the horse's mouth. So let's have a look. Three things have to be present. Water droplets pass through the air. Pass, there's movement, casting off negative ions. So we've got to have movement, moisture and air. Whenever you've got movement, moisture and air, you've got the production of negative ions. If you've got a lot of moisture but not a lot of movement or air, what have you got growing there now? Mould, that's right. So moisture, movement and air. Where do we find moisture, movement and air? The thunderstorm. And I think we can all identify with the smell of the air when the thunderstorm hits. It's lovely, isn't it? I sometimes get that smell when I'm watering my garden. Because when I'm watering my garden, what have I got? Moisture, movement and air. Also the ocean waves. The ocean waves pounding against the, the rocks is creating those negative ions. Also the waterfalls. All forests are higher in negative ions than when there's no forest. Because remember what those leaves are doing, they're giving off oxygen. But there is a type of tree that gives off more, and that's the pine. Because the pine needles are so numerous. So with pine needles, you get a huge surface area, giving off moisture, giving off oxygen. And you only have to get the slightest breath of wind, and you get those needles moving. Just, for, just not far from the front of my house, I have some big pine trees, and I love the sound of the wind in the pine trees, almost sounds like rushing water. And when my little grandchildren are with me, I say, listen, listen to the wind in the pine trees. On the other hand, we've got positive ions. We're referring to the negative charge and the positive charge here. Remember that positive ions are positively bad for you because po positive ions have more carbon dioxide in their molecule than oxygen. You would never think of hydration when you're thinking of oxygen. But under a microscope, blood cells look like this. They're moving around. They're moving at around at an incredible rate. But if someone's dehydrated, the blood cells clump. It's actually called roulette. Let's have a look at carbon monoxide because carbon monoxide is the enemy of oxygen and I'll show you why. So carbon monoxide, when it's breathed in, it forms a very tight union on the blood cell. But when oxygen's breathed in, it forms a very 
unstable union, very loose. And the reason for that is when that blood cell is going through our body, it can drop the oxygen quickly wherever it is needed. So if someone's breathing in carbon monoxide and oxygen, can you see the, the monoxide is going to grab it first? Because it forms a very tight union. How can you retain it? Run up and down those hills every day. Strengthen your abdominal muscles. Do your push-ups every day. Do your core strengthening exercises every day. And breathe deeply and make sure those windows are open, especially while you're sleeping. So you can prevent uh, the loss of that lung capacity if you do that. And if you have lost that lung capacity, you can regain it by exercising it. And how do you exercise it? Breathing very, very deeply. So what we have done here is we have explored many ways that you can ensure that you're getting adequate oxygen. I know when I was homeschooling my children and the long division was getting difficult and I found the children when they're not you know, when they're not getting something, they can even be difficult to work with, they're feeling bad, so I'd call a break. Okay, skipping rope, trampoline, run around the house three times, get on your bike. They'd come back ten minutes later like this. <sighs> can you see the faith? Mm -hmm. And well, they'd get it. <laughs> so when you are studying, and hopefully you all are studying, we should be learning new things every single day. Remember to take little breaks and get on that rebound or that exercise bike or run around the house or run up a hill and get replenish those brain cells with the oxygen so that you can learn new things. We should be learning new things right up until the, until the day we die. So you can see why oxygen is the most vital element needed for life.